Nicole did an amazing job, so she's inspired me. Um, this talk is something we've never done before, but I asked um, some of the Perth mums that have been helping me plan this conference what sort of uh, things they'd like to hear about. And one of the things they suggested is a bit of a research update, but kind of starting from the basics. So the idea of this is to provide a little bit of context, a um, bit of an introduction into what's been going on in tuberous sclerosis <coughs> research. And uh, for the rest of the weekend, you'll get, I guess, deep dives into various aspects of, of how tuberous sclerosis affects the body and the exciting things that are happening, um, delivering new treatments already and lots of treatments that are in trials. So that's the idea of it. The first thing I wanted to do is explain who I was. And in the context of this presentation, I think it's really important to explain that I'm not a doctor. I'm certainly not a biochemist. And importantly, I'm not your doctor or your child's doctor. So this sort of applies for the whole weekend. But anything you hear here is fairly generic. And the wonderful and frustrating part of tuberous sclerosis is that everyone is so different. So anything you hear here should be, um, if you're interested in finding out more information about how it might apply to you, is all about taking, taking that information back to your team of doctors and, and discussing it with them. But certainly, um, this presentation is about trying to give you some information in a fairly understandable way. So it goes through, I guess, a layperson's translation. Um, I've asked Petrus to wave at me if I'm saying something that's incorrect. But if I'm oversimplifying, I think we can get away with that. Um, so that's about who I'm not. But who I am is the older sister to... Oh, Nicole got through it without crying. <laughs> I'm the older sister to Lizzie Pinkerton, who many of you will have met if you've been around ATSS for a while, and the daughter of a very inspiring woman, Sue Pinkerton, who up until August last year was the president of our association. Um, Lizzie passed away in almost three years ago. Um, she was unlucky enough to have both tuberous sclerosis and polycystic kidney disease. So that life experience has given me a lot of passion um, and also a lot of information about TSC. Um, I do have an undergraduate degree in science and I'm currently studying public health. Um, and I've attended three, I think, international research conferences. So that's, I guess, my credentials for standing up here today. What I wanted to talk about is, um, just because we haven't tasked any of our other speakers with this, is a little bit of a general idea of what tuberous sclerosis is. I'm probably saying something you know, but there's a few speakers in the room that may not have had this introduction, so I'll do that really quickly. Um, and then really just talking about what's been achieved in research so far and to me what's really exciting is the sort of directions that the research is taking into the future. So a few little facts about TSC. So um, we think it affects about 1 in 6,000 live births, so they call that incidence. Or if you kind of take a survey out of the population, about 1 in 9,000. Those numbers, like many rare diseases, are kind of best guesses. Um, we don't usually put lots of money into doing big prevalence studies to work that out. But if you kind of take all the studies that have been done, they're the numbers that are our best estimates. The interesting thing is that gives you a total around the world of more than a million people. And that's kind of the stat that I really like. You, you sort of think about, you're not really that alone. I feel like more than a million people around the world, um, it's, a, it's a great um, idea to think that there's not, you're not struggling all by yourself. I had an interesting situation where I, um, I won't tell the whole story, but I was in an adult day program in Beijing while I was on holidays, and a, a lovely young lady came out, and I knew straight away she had tuberous sclerosis. There was just something about her, and I found out she had been diagnosed, um, she had epilepsy surgery, um, and she was receiving great care in China, and I emailed exchange with her father for a little while. So you just sort of imagine all those people around the world. Um, it can be inherited, but as a lot of you will know, in most people, TSC is the first diagnosis in their family, so a result of a sporadic genetic mutation. And David Ravine will come this afternoon and talk a little bit more about genetics. And a huge amount of variability. Um, so a lot of people live their lives without really feeling many effects of tuberous sclerosis. And others um, have quite devastating impact on their lives and their families. Really quick kind of overview of the body. Um, so tuberous sclerosis affects pretty much any organ in the body, but these are the ones that we look out for that tend to cause problems. So the brain, for example, we see the cortical tubers and the subvenable giant cell astrocytomas, scary ones in the brain. 
um, and lots of other impacts that we'll find out more about today. Um, in the heart, rhabdomyomas, which Nicole mentioned. Um, in the kidneys, which we'll have Hamant talking about tomorrow morning. Um, we get AMLs, cysts, and as I mentioned, polycystic kidney disease in the unlucky few. In the skin, as Nicole mentioned, we get angiofibromas, as well as a few other signs that we look for. In the lungs, there's a fairly serious condition that affects primarily females, and I'm not going to try and say what LAM stands for. Do you want to have a go, Petrus? <laughs> and that's why we call it LAM. <laughs> That'll be our sobriety test tonight at dinner. <laughs> Obviously, that means I'm already drunk. Um, <laughs> And you know, in the eyes, the, for a lot of people, um, it's an interesting sign, but for a small um, minority, it causes some problems as well. Um, and you know, any part of the body, liver, all these sorts of different places, so it's all about keeping an eye on things. But a lot of those areas will go into a more detail with the experts over this weekend. So that's my general overview. Now we get into what I was here to talk about. So the main message, and, and these slides have been adapted from a wonderful presentation by Vicky Whittemore in Sydney in 2011, who is um, much more, uh, has a lot more expertise than me. Um, the real message is that there's been amazing progress compared to some other, or most other, genetic disorders. So I remember, as a, I would have been a teenager in the 1990s, it was exciting to find out that they knew where the gene was. You know, we knew that TSC1 was on chromosome 9, and have I got that right? Yes. <laughs> and TSC2 was on chromosome 16. Didn't really mean much to our everyday lives, but you sort of, oh, something exciting's happened. Um, and then in 2002, these very smart scientists figured out that these genes produce proteins. So in, the, in your general body, genes produce proteins, chemicals that do stuff. So we figured out which proteins these genes were producing, and we figured out that they had a role in controlling how, how cells grow, and particularly how big they grow and how many grow, which kind of makes sense when you think about what, what tuberous sclerosis is. But they figured out which ones that was and how that sort of worked. And then figured out that these two chemicals together, so the, the protein that TSC1 makes and the protein that TSC2 makes, they come together and the job they do in your body is regulating this thing called an mTOR pathway. Now, I have a, uh, a scientist, as a, a proper scientist, as a sister-in-law and she sat down and tried to explain to me what a protein pathway was several times. But just think about it as a chemical reaction that keeps your body under control and tells, tells your cells what to do. So this thing called mTOR, they figured it out. And the good thing was, is that we already had some medicine that worked on this, on this pathway. And so that led us very, very, very quickly to a clinical trial that sort of started up in 2005. And then, again, very, very quickly, in the scheme of things and relative to other diseases, we ended up in, certainly in the US in 2010, was the first treatment specifically for tuberous sclerosis. And the example that Vicky gave to give yourselves a feeling of how fast this was relative to other diseases, is that, for example, Huntington's, which many of you might have heard of, they've had their genes discovered before the tuberous sclerosis genes. They're nowhere <coughs> near an idea of a, any sort of targeted treatment. So, in a sense, you can think we're incredibly unlucky to live with this disease, but in another sense, I could, I'd pick TS over some of the other ones, because there's a lot of exciting stuff happening. That's just my opinion. I'm totally happy with the idea that everyone else might disagree. The other interesting thing that gives me a lot of hope is this graph. So, my sister was born in 84, so it's a coincidence that this graph was produced by someone else for 84 onwards. And you look through to where we are today, the 2012 numbers actually are missing December, I think, so I don't think we're going backwards, but we're going in the right direction. And that's a really amazing number of publications that um, people are doing that talk about tuberous sclerosis. And I think it'd be really interesting to see an mTOR version of this because everyone's pretty excited about that. There are links um, with the research going on in tuberous sclerosis with cancer and autism and lots of other areas, and so everyone's really excited. The other thing that I wanted to do is put up this picture, which I actually drew a couple of years ago after attending my first TSC um, research conference, because not being a scientist, I couldn't kind of figure out what they were talking about. Um, so, <laughs> oh, broken a pen. I think I might have to take my necklace off. I'm interfering with the mic. Is that okay? Sorry, Mark. Um, I think of basic science research as being the research they do in a petri dish. Yeah. 
They get a bunch of cells and they get them to grow in a culture. If they do a whole lot of research through there, that's why it's wider at this end, they get some interesting results and they pick a really small number of those things to try and figure out in translational research. I'm oversimplifying it, but a lot of translational research kind of happens in mice. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> these lovely little mice help us out in figuring out what kind of is the next thing that's going to happen. And then we get to clinical research. And it's getting pretty narrow at that end because we do an awful lot of work to figure out the small amount of things that might be helpful to patients. So that's the way I think about it. Petrus is looking at me quizzically, so hopefully that's not too bad. Um, and from all of that work, I sort of think these are the achievements that are impacting us on a day-to-day -day basis um, that are interesting to talk about. Genetic testing, um, and certainly this was in my case, um, I was tested for Lizzie's mutation and uh, that provided me with a lot of reproductive confidence, as the geneticists say, um, in having my lovely little almost two-year-old. And so I think that now that gene testing is becoming more accessible to people, that's been a really wonderful thing um, that's come out of this research. I'm going to say nothing else about that because David will be coming this afternoon to talk about that. mTOR inhibitor medicines you're going to hear a lot about. Um, I'm going to give you the really simplified version, and that's the one where Petrus would start to correct me. And clinical guidelines, which is something I think are very exciting. So I'm going to talk about the last two. Now we've got a game. Can anyone see the difference between those two pictures? Yep. <laughs> so what these are, <laughs> Charlene's picked a, I mean, it's, you know, it's fairly easy. What these two things are, are wrapper logs, which I thought was a cute word. So these two things are in mTOR inhibitor medicines. Um, wrapper logs come from rapamycin analogs. Um, and we get a lot of questions on Facebook and by email and on the phone trying to figure out what are the difference between these two things? Are they the same thing? Are they different? So I thought that might be an interesting thing to cover off early. It's okay if you're still confused because occasionally I get confused. So um, <laughs> at their most generic, I, we think of it as, I think of it as wrapper and rad, which is kind of the words the scientists often use. Well, it's certainly on the left-hand side of my picture. Um, so they're sort of the words that, that go together with these two medicines that are offering us some interesting options and a, and a bit of hope. So then I thought I'd try and give a bit of an idea of where we're at with those two medicines. So rapa or rapamycin or sirolimus, um, there's been lots and lots of studies into this medicine. So it's, it's the cheaper of the two, so it tends to be used a bit more by the scientists. It's been trialled in, in small studies, so smaller studies for some indications, so Seegers and kidney AMLs and LAM. It's being used experimentally by quite a lot of patients around the world. When we talk about experimental use of medications in real people, it's called off-label. So it means the label on the box says it's for a kidney particular thing not to do with TSC. What we actually use it for is something else. So that's uh, something we do when we really have no other options. Um, and as Nicole Stone mentioned, um, we've got a randomised trial going on for the topical cream for facial angiofibromas. So the sort of things that medicine's used for. The picture on the bottom right is because the medicine comes from Easter Island, and we were in Washington in 2011, and uh, they had one of the giants in the uh, Natural History Museum, probably. Yes. Um, and that's a picture of Sue in the middle, I'm on the left with my little boy, and um, Cheryl Brassel, our New Zealand contact. So we had a photo in front of the, the giant head. I quite like that one. And then RAD, which you'll probably know as Everolimus uh, more commonly. So there's been randomised trials in all those areas, um, are either happening or in good planning, I suppose. We're getting there on those. Um, and then approvals, which we often get questions about. So you heard me mention that we had the first approval in 2010. Um, that was Everolimus for Seegers in the US. Europe followed shortly after. Um, in Australia and New Zealand, we've got there for Seegers. We've got approval. And that means that it's OK and fairly easy for your doctor to prescribe it. What's not easy is paying for it. So um, we haven't quite got the next hurdle in drug approval, which is PBS listing. Um, so we had that meeting, first meeting for that last year, um, and that conversation is ongoing. Um, so that's where the approval's at for Australia. And then in North America, the USA and um, Europe, there's approval for kidney AMLs for that medicine, but not yet in Australia. We hope in Australia this year and New Zealand next year, but um, that's a process that's ongoing. And there's a fair few people using this medicine experimentally as well. So that's where those medicines are up to. I'm not going to give you the detail of all those things. That's what you're going to hear from other people later on today, the actual doctors that know more about it than me. But that hopefully starts to get the two medicines 
um, clear in your mind. Again, this is my version of it. <laughs> it's always scary talking, mentioning the words side effects when you're not a doctor. Um, and the Novartis uh, people up the back are welcome to block their ears because they've got regulatory um, uh, obligations whenever side effects are mentioned. I'm being generic, don't worry guys. Um, so the limitations really are that the medicines don't work for everyone. Um, it seems that you've probably got to remain on treatment to prevent recurrence or regrowth. So it's not a, you know, take a pill for a while and you'll be right forever. Um, some really serious side effects for some people. Um, probably not as bad as we thought they were back when we first started using the medicine in tuberous sclerosis, but for some people will come off the medicine because the side effects are just too bad. And then what we really don't know yet is for, for a particular individual, how does a, a clinician make a decision of whether this medicine is worth trying or not? So that cost versus benefits on an individual basis. As a medical community, all the doctors are still figuring it out. And one of our things all I like to do is make sure they're talking to each other and that helps them figure it out together. The other aspect beyond mTOR inhibitors that I wanted to mention, and I'll go really quickly because I've talked too long already, is clinical guidelines. Um, what clinical guidelines are, uh, starting points for doctors. So doctors can't be experts in every disease, um, but clinical guidelines give them a way of sort of hearing from the experts as to what a group of experts think might be the way you'd treat this disease. And then from then on, they uh, look at making decisions for any particular individual patient. I'm hoping once we get publication from the meeting that was held last year, I can have much more information and exciting um, you know, promotions of these clinical guidelines in Australia to all of the doctors and certainly to you guys as well. But it's been really great to hear from the team of doctors that met last year in America, including um, David Moat from Sydney. We managed to push an Australian into that meeting, which was great. Um, they came out with a series of guidelines about tuberous sclerosis that are going to be published soon, but they also made a commitment to keep them up to date. So that's really exciting. So it'd be great to have something more solid to help our doctors. And then, again, I'm going to have to go really quickly. Um, this is something that Vicky said, which I thought found quite interesting, is the idea that we started off describing tuberous sclerosis by talking to patients. Then we took what we knew and we took it to the laboratory. So we call that in the bench. And then we figured out some stuff. And now we've taken it back to the patients. And now that cycle's just keeping on going. Um, so what's happening in research? So figuring out more about this mTOR pathway, um, figuring out how it is that a particular gene mutation leads to a particular version, I suppose, of tuberous sclerosis. Even in the same families, you've got one gene mutation, lots of variability. Figuring that out might be a key to more treatments. Um, figuring out new drug targets, testing new medicines, um, in both the petri dish as well as the, uh, the mice. Um, and then clinical research. So particularly the last point, understanding which treatments should be used for which patients and when. That's a really big, important thing. I'm not going to go through this, but I might send it out to people later. This is just um, the list of um, priorities for a big US-based international research program, which we hope Congress will have agreed to fund in the US this week. Um, the TSC research program funded by the Department of Defense. And uh, there's a whole lot of things there about um, the things that they want to look at funding, which is kind of more detail around some of the things that I mentioned. But here you get my version. So these are the big questions that I'm hoping we answer over the next decade to be ambitious. So why the big variability in tuberous sclerosis? Why are we all so different? If we can figure out what causes that, can we figure out how to get everyone on the mild side? You know, that to me would be pretty cool. Um, you've got 10 years, guys. <laughs> Can we predict progression of tuberous sclerosis? So there's research into things called biomarkers and all sorts of other things that are going on. But one thing that I find really challenging in talking to families, particularly when they've just been diagnosed, is the lack of a crystal ball. As Nicole said, well, yeah, you'll probably have an intellectual disability. We don't know how bad. Don't really know. Could be really bad. Could not be. Mm. That's a really tough message to live with. So if we can do some more things to help understand and and predict some of that, I think that would be really powerful. Um, as we talked about before, which treatments work for which people. And what I find really difficult now that I'm sort of exploring in my master's degree kind of health policy and health economics is more data kind of to, to help the policy makers get it right. So more information about how tuberous sclerosis affects quality of life so that they can sit there with a limited health budget and make the right decisions. 
the right decisions obviously to fund medication and care and respite and all those sorts of things that help people living with tuberous sclerosis. So um, I'm going to finish now because it's my responsibility to make the day run on time, so I'll be kicking myself later on. So as I mentioned, I've stolen some slides and inspiration from Dr Vicky Whittemore, who's a wonderful um, doctor that's been involved, research doctor that's been involved in the Tuberous Sclerosis Alliance in America for a long time and now runs the epilepsy program run out of the National Institutes of Health in the USA. Um, she has tuberous sclerosis herself, um, and so is wonderful. Um, if anyone thinks that they would benefit from Vicky's version of this, albeit two years old, uh, we have that on a recording, so let me know and we can send a copy through to you. Um, the wonderful ATSS committee for all their support for me, um, and <laughs> you can read the last one. <laughs>